Today we're going to talk about Netflix specials versus YouTube specials. And we'll take a look at a couple comedians as case studies. Welcome to Catching You Up with... Nadal. It's going so I'd like to thank the executive producer of this week's episode, Fix the Ring Light, you j Without their big baller support, it'd be very difficult for me to put this episode out on a consistent basis. But because of Fix the Ring Light, you j I am able to put this high caliber workout. If you would like to become an executive producer of this show, click the Patreon link in the YouTube description below. Also comment, rate, subscribe, share with your friends, all that jazz, it all helps with the algorithm. So comedy specials, why are they made? And who do they serve? They serve the comedian. They're advertisements for why you should buy tickets to their live shows. They serve the distributors that they're broadcasted on. It keeps the consumer on their platform and that's what every platform wants. Oh fuck, so-and-so just dropped the Showtime special? All right, I'll get a free trial for that and then forget to turn it off. But most importantly, they serve us, the fans. We were just able to escape reality and we're able to forget how much our life sucks. Good for us, we're getting through it together. For a while now, you've heard every comedian and their mother talk about how great it is to put out your own content. But why is that? And is it always true? What are the benefits of having a stand-up special on YouTube versus having one on Netflix? Well, everything has to do with timing. What's the industry like right now? What was the industry like two years ago? What's the industry gonna look like in two years from now? So I'm going to analyze the thought process on how a comedian would possibly choose where to broadcast their stand-up special. And I'd like to remind everyone that I'm not a comedian. So anything that I do say right now is actually completely. Not a it's so good guy. No, I'm not that one. This is a totally unconfirmed news. One thing that is true for almost every seasoned comedian is that they will benefit from having a stand-up special. There will be people that like it. There will be people that discover you because of it. A stand-up special is the perfect showcase for why someone should be buying tickets to their live show. Here's my sense of humor. Do you like it? You should get a babysitter. Well, how dare you charge this much for a show when you just started touring after you just dropped a special? Leading up to a special, most comedians don't have one hour of material. They have different versions of one hour that they perform on stage with. Some comedy specials take three months to edit. I've seen some of them take nine months to edit before they're released to the public. And in that nine months, they take all their leftover bits, add in new extra bits, they go to comedy clubs, they do pop-ins, so that by the time that their special comes out, they have a touring hour. Because when you see a comedian drop a special, that's when they're in your head the most. So a comedian that you really like just dropped an hour, and now they're touring with a brand new hour you've never seen before? Oh no, what a money grab. Get over it, that's how it works. So that's the function of a comedy special. Now comes the question, where do you stream it? Do you self-produce? Do you go with the streaming service? Which streaming service? Would fans buy it off of a comedian's website? The direction that you take should always lean towards what will convert to ticket sales. Let's take a look at a couple case studies. Example number one, Chris Stefano. Chrissy Specials was gaining more and more notoriety in the comedy podcast scene. I've always been a big fan, and I met you, I thought you were so fucking funny, and I've watched you just go up, 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 up. You have a special coming out mm -hmm. that you're so hot, we don't even know where it's gonna land. You ready for this, we're about to tell you guys? So yeah. I was confident. I said, I filmed a special at the Gramercy Theater, yep. March 5th. Came out great by my guy, The Homeless Pimp. We filmed it, <laughs> edited it, and I said to my agent, I said, I'm putting this on YouTube, he goes, fine. He goes, this looks pretty good, can I just send to the people at Netflix. They're gonna say no, I'm not a transgender Eskimo, they're not gonna give me a shot. <laughs> That's what I said in an email. And it was insane that things were moving as quickly as they were moving this close up to him planning to release it. April 6th, YouTube, and then I called Nadav. I said, I wanna get on Segura. When does this episode come out? He said, April 6th. I was like, wow, it's meant to be. Perfect. April 6th is what's coming out. The newest development, I'm talking about as of last night, I had already landed in Austin. Yeah. My agent goes, is there any chance you could push Segura back? I said, absolutely fucking not. I'm already in Austin with an earache and body aches. <laughs> I'm already in Texas with full COVID. I said, uh, what's going on? He goes, Netflix loves this thing. They love it and they want to just give you, like they want to put it on Netflix. In two, three weeks, like at the end of April, they want to put it on by. So not only did he recoup his costs pretty quickly, 
he would have recouped them pretty quickly through ticket sales either way. But he's now on Netflix. Our next case study is going to be Matt Reif. Over the last year, Matt Reif exploded on TikTok and social media. He's been around for a while, he just only now started blowing up. And he capitalized on it expertly in my opinion. His audience seems to consist out of a noticeable amount of women fawning over him, which is a rare demographic to have in comedy, but also not at all a bad one to have. Matt is killing it. He went from having trouble filling out clubs to adding dates onto his theater tours. He's got tens of millions of views on his TikToks. He's released three YouTube specials in the span of 24 months on his YouTube channel. And all of them have north of 10 million views. Sure, he could produce his own special and get another 10 million views on YouTube, but what he did was a little bit smarter than that. He already has the TikTok crowd. He already has the YouTube crowd coming to his shows. But do YouTube and TikTok have the same demographics as Netflix? I don't think so. Matt parlayed his popularity into being exposed to a new audience and priming himself for being one of the most gigantic names touring in comedy today. Plus, you know Netflix paid him a fucking bag on that. And whether you think Matt Reif is funny or not, I like these moves, homie. In this next case study, I'm gonna talk about Stavros Halkis and Shane Gillis. Even though they seem worlds apart from Matt Reif, they also took kind of a similar approach. Each of them have been funny for a long time. But if executives at a streaming platform looked at Stavros, they'd be like, this guy's known for being on a podcast called Come Town Pass. Or they'd look at Shane and be like, this is the guy that got fired from SNL pass. But these comedians saw value in themselves. They knew they were crushing it on YouTube. So what did they do? They made their own special and it smashed. Each of those specials respectively were probably the best special of the year. They've now confirmed, hey, the audience likes us. And now they've primed themselves for a really great deal from Netflix where they could really get that fucking bag on the second special. But here's one of the biggest cons in having your special being broadcasted on Netflix or Amazon Prime or Showtime. That streaming platform now owns that recorded hour. Now when you upload it yourself, you own everything. You can break everything off into little reels, little TikToks, each one of those splintering off with the opportunity to go viral and blowing you the fuck up. And now let's backpedal a little bit because Nick Mullen also just released his own self-produced YouTube special called Year of the Dragon, which has only been out for about 72 hours so far, but it's north of 700,000 views, and in my opinion, is one of the funniest specials of the year. He expressed a sentiment on the Adam Friedland show that I think is accurate. It's been a wild ride the last seven years, being pulled out of comedy obscurity by probably the most low effort thing that I, I've ever done, I guess, creatively, which was the Come Town podcast, um, to be, uh, you know, then find myself now in middle age trying to piece together a career with, but then also stand up, which is now blown up. Stand up is in this bizarre, and there are a lot of, you know, people are very talented, but I don't, I don't know if it's because of the pandemic or what. There's all of this... Uh, money and stand up right now so it'd be dumb not to be doing it um and so i have a special coming out another case study to look at is the only fans route now i know that only fans has been trying to get out of the only fans business and trying to attract more talent and one thing that i really love to see is whitney cummings capitalizing on that so she went and did the roast of burt kreischer she went and did her own roast and she released her comedy special on OnlyFans. Now, personally, I was a fan of all three of those. I thought they were all super fun to watch. I honestly love these boss moves. I mean, another example of this is seeing what Gas Digital is doing with stand-up comedy specials. They just produced and released six half-hour specials for Luis J. Gomez, Dave Smith, Kurt Metzger, Jordan Jensen, Rich Voss, and Colin Tyrell. I've seen the majority of them and they're all worth a watch. I'll have links for each of them in the description below for you. But some people might look at these specials and they're like, oh, this doesn't even have a million views. Like, I bet you feel so bad fucking having this shit on there. You think that isn't going to translate to ticket sales? These specials are serving their purpose. Now, the second to last case study I'm gonna talk about is Bill Burr. Bill Burr is not a comedian that's going to need to release anything on YouTube in the near future. The only reason I'd see him doing it is maybe he's doing like a Bill Burr Presents type deal. But Bill is a brand name. He can sell his special to any streaming platform and they will pay top dollar for it. And once you get to that level, you really should just be trying to get as big of a bag as you possibly can. I mean, Dave Chappelle getting like, what, 20 or 40 million dollars for all of his specials? That's fucking wild. 
Now, the last case study I'm going to mention is really probably one of the only consistent examples of this. Whenever I get an email from Louis CK's mailing list, I'm like, oh my God, I can't wait to see what the fuck he's trying to sell me. Yeah, I'll pay five bucks for that. I mean, Andrew Schultz did that with his special, but that was revolving around big drama and controversy. Louis sends one email blast saying, hey, I have a new special. You could buy it for five bucks um, or for an extra five bucks. You could get my entire catalog of specials, whatever you want to do. I'll be OK. I mean, he doesn't say that, but like that's the cadence that he has in the emails. Now, look, there's definitely a whole bunch more about YouTube specials and Netflix specials and the decisions that go into producing them a certain way or releasing them in a certain way. But there's between nine and a million ways to skin a cat. That's how the saying goes. That was kind of my two cents on YouTube and Netflix specials and just how fun it is to be living in today's society where people are competing for our attention. They're trying to make us laugh and for free. A couple specials that I personally liked. These are in no order. I really liked Year of the Dragon by Nick Mullen, Hello World by Nate Bargatze, Cowabunga by Ralph Barbosa, Dog Belly by Big J Okerson, Fat Rascal by Stavros Halkis, and Beautiful Dogs by Shane Gillis. And with that, I would like to say thank you for watching another very special episode of Catching You Up With. On a doll, it's COVID. I would like to thank all the people that have signed up on my Patreon and our producers of this show. You're seeing their names on the screen right now, immortalized forever. If you would like to participate in supporting this show, click the link in the YouTube description below. And if you're at $10 and up, you will see your name on this very screen. Oh, wow. I'd like to remind you one more time to subscribe right now, comment on this video, rate it, share it with your friends. It all helps with the algorithm. But of course, most importantly, I do need to remind you all that this is a totally unconfirmed news.